My name is Diane, and uh, I founded Trace Genomics about four years ago. And our mission is to create a digital fingerprint of every acre of soil that where we're growing food from around the world. And so in this talk, I'm going to share a little bit about how we're using DNA sequencing, microbiology, data science, artificial intelligence to revolutionize the way that we're growing food and to help feed the growing population. What is a global food challenge? It's estimated that in just under 30 years, our global population will grow to be about 10 billion people. That means that we're going to have to increase our production by over 70 percent. 30 years is not very long when we think about the time it takes to deliver drugs and chemicals and new solutions into the market. So how are we going to do this? We have to really fundamentally change the way that we're growing food. It's estimated that annually, plant diseases cost an economic loss of 200 billion U.S. dollars worldwide. And they are often epidemics, meaning that they're catastrophic and have really severe effects on our population. Uh, a popular example is the Irish potato famine. The Irish potato famine cost over a million lives. And it actually took about five years from the first onset of the disease, the identification of the first field that was diseased, to the time when we even figured out what the organism, what pathogen was causing that disease. It took five years. And that's really just the first step to finding a solution. So first you identify the disease, then you research the solution. Other diseases, like the Panama disease, nearly wiped out our banana population as we know it. That's one of the reasons why today, often people complain that the bananas are not as flavorful as the ones that used to be around. And bananas are staple crops to many countries in Africa, and in Southeast Asia. And what's interesting is that this number is actually an underestimate. Because only the most detrimental diseases, where the plants are essentially melting in the field, only those incidences are categorized as diseases. There are many, many diseases, what we call silent diseases, that affect healthy plants that are never reported because plants can't go to the doctor, they can't speak for themselves. Unlike humans, where you might report a very wide spectrum of symptoms from different diseases, and you might go to the doctor and you might get affected with a disease that causes you to be a little weaker, but you still continue to live, plant diseases that are silent are hard to track but they're estimated to cause approximately 10 to 15 percent of economic losses. My grandfather was a farmer, and when I grew up, I used to play on his fields, and I saw how hard it was to grow a crop. He goes out in, in every morning and really invests a whole season of sweat and labor before he is able to reap the harvest of all of his, that work. And when the crop is good, he is proud of his, the food that he's able to put on the table for his family. But I also saw that farming is really still a guessing game. There are so many decisions that go into that season, hundreds and hundreds of decisions that a farmer makes, and many, many factors that affect the yield of the plant. Some of those are out of our control, like weather. Climate change has dramatically changed the way that we farm. But some of them are in our control, like how much we irrigate, how much fertilizer, what fertilizer we put in the soil, what crops we rotate with. Some of these decisions are better for our fields, organic, sustainable farming, and some are worse, more chemical use. But the choices and what choices you make are often based on what your neighbor is doing, what your grandfather did, they're very seldomly based on data-driven decisions. Over the last five to ten years, we've seen, luckily, an influx of technology onto the farm, whether it's satellite imagery, drone imagery, uh, IoT sensors, uh, moisture sensors, 
um, and even big data analytics software to help the farmer organize all of these decisions and optimize that. But when it comes to below ground information, the farmer today still has very little access to what's actually happening below their feet. But actually, that population is incredibly important. In every tablespoon of soil, you have over a million organisms of bacteria, fungi, nematodes, viruses. Some of these organisms are essential organisms, meaning that they actually play a symbiotic, have a symbiotic relationship with that plant. So when a seed goes into the ground, the plant starts growing and roots start forming immediately in that soil. Those roots aren't for living alone. The organisms attach to the root and form symbiotic relationships to provide nutrients for that plant. When you add nitrogen to the soil, it's converted through a number of pathways to make available for the plant. Similarly with phosphorus, potassium, and so forth. There are also pathogens. When we talk about plant diseases, often those are caused by a pathogen that attacks a plant. That's a harmful microbe. But there are all these other microbes that live in the soil that sometimes are not pathogenic and are not essential. Some of them actually compete with the pathogen for nutrients. They don't interact with the plant, but they interact with the pathogen, maybe fighting over the same uh, set of nutrients. And those are actually beneficial organisms because when they exist in the soil, they compete with the pathogen and therefore prevent diseases from for forming on the plant. And so all these interactions are happening in the ground, and the industry is starting to wake up to this. Over the last few years, we've seen a huge growth of the, what we call the biologicals market. Agricultural biologicals are projected to be, grow to an estimated $12 billion uh, market in just a few years. And large companies like Monsanto, Pioneer, Syngenta, DuPont, are all starting to invest millions and millions of dollars into creating and finding these natural organisms that will help the plant grow and achieve higher yields without having to create new GMOs and without having to compromise our need to grow food more sustainably and more organically. The problem is, as we started to harvest these essential microbes and understand the microbiome, we took them into the field trials and we then made seed coatings out of them or sprayed them into the ground. And what the industry started to see is that they work really, really well on some fields and not so well on other fields. They have very high variability. When we look at this problem, we recognize it as something we've seen before in the human medical field. Remember in 2000, we were very, very excited globally about the possibility of sequencing the human genome. We invested over a billion dollars to sequence that genome, and it was announced, and we watched, and cancer wasn't cured. It turns out it's a lot more complex than sequencing one genome. It turns out all of us here in this room have different genomes, slightly different genomes, that respond differently to different drugs. There are very few magical drugs out there, but there are lots of drugs that work for some of us and not others. And precision medicine is a movement to making genome sequencing way cheaper, from over a billion dollars to just a few hundred dollars today where we can access that information and build a database to deliver drugs better, more precisely. And when we saw this problem in, in agriculture, in the microbiome space, we said, aha, we need to champion the same revolution and make this data available to the farmer and put the soil microbiome information back into their hands so they have the power to decide what solutions work best for them because all these microbes interact in a very complex manner. And in order to understand that complexity, you need a lot of data. So our solution, in a nutshell, is essentially a kit that we send to farmers. They send us a little bit of their soil, and we take in soil from around the world uh, that have varying levels of different chemicals and uh, compounds, and we extract the DNA from the many millions of organisms that live in that tube. We get this clean uh, solution of DNA and we sequence it 
using the sequencing technology that uh, really fueled our genomics revolution. We get a file that represents a DNA fingerprint from that tube, and we upload it to the cloud. We build parallel computing um, systems to be able to process and identify the DNA sequences to the identity of the microbes in just under 30 minutes. And the last piece is if you deliver a list of millions of microbes to the farmer, they will look at you blankly and ask you what you want them to do with it. So the most important piece is not just in all the DNA sequencing and identification, but rather interpreting that for the farmer in terms of actionable insights. The way they use it is they look across a field. Um, a field, unlike a human, that has you know, many, many samples that can be taken. So typically what a farmer does is they look across high-yielding fields and low-yielding areas of that field, and they take samples from these variability uh, areas. And then they send them in to us, whether it's to look for a disease risk, so in this particular case, we're looking at a lettuce field that has varying levels of disease to a disease called fusarium. And they can use it to pre-screen the field before planting and then make different planting decisions. Some varieties are more resistant to the disease than others, and so they can choose uh, which variety to plant. But in addition to looking at disease, each sample that the farmer takes across that field allows them to start to build a digital map. Other layers of insights that we deliver to the farmer are around nutrient potential. Recall that I mentioned that there are some essential microbes that turn nitrogen into a form that's available for the plant. So we look at these pathways and help the farmer make better fertility decisions, um, recommendations for additives and biologicals. We look at soil health metrics, sustainability, diversity, and even some physical metrics like uh, drainage. And what we focus on at the end of the day is not the cool technology, whether it's DNA sequencing or data science. None of that really matters. What matters is delivering actionable insights for the farmer. What decisions can you inform with each of these insights? So we're focused not on the interestingness of the microbes, but rather synthesizing that into a user-friendly, easily interpretable report. By helping every individual farmer farm better, what we're also doing is building a global ecosystem, a geotemporal map of the microbes in every farm from around the world. And what's interesting is our technology is not looking for one or a set of predetermined pathogens. It creates a digital fingerprint of all of the organisms that live in that soil, and then we use software to ask what are the pathogens? We build models to predict nutrient availability and disease risk. And that means that as microbes evolve, and they evolve very quickly, uh, much more quickly than human beings do, as they evolve and we're seeing new diseases come on uh, to the market and affect the crops, we can actually stay one, head, one step ahead of that disease. Because wildfires, like plant diseases, are much easier to prevent than it is to fight after it's spread. And in doing this, what we're really hoping to do is change and revolutionize the way that we're finding and delivering therapeutics. Currently, again, it takes a long time to find the, the causative agent for the disease and then to run a set of lab experiments to find the solution for that disease. But with a database of all the diseased fields across the world and all the healthy fields and the pathogenetic information of the pathogens and the beneficial microbes in those same fields, what we're doing is creating a database that will fuel innovation and make it much faster to identify emerging diseases and make it much faster to identify the competitive beneficial organisms that suppress those diseases. Farming is one of the hardest jobs in the, in the world. And one, microbiomes are, if you know, uh, have looked at microbiome science, it's an extremely complex field. And there are complex problems like this, like human genomics, where it's really difficult to solve by looking at just one individual or one field. We really have to step back and look at the problem on a global scale. 
And only by building this sort of big database and understanding the variability of the problem are we able to then come up with innovative solutions and tackle these diseases. So for example, control agents, next generation control agents for the diseases, um, new GMOs, new plant varieties that are resistant to the diseases of today and tomorrow, not the diseases of yesterday. And even antifungal therapeutics for uh, human health. We've got nowhere else to go. We've got to figure out how to farm on this planet and feed our growing population. So let's work together and save our soils and find a way to grow food for our future generations sustainably for years to come. Thank you.